This is the Can Crushers Wrestling Podcast. The following contest is scheduled for one fall. Let's go nuts! It's Jimmy Nuts! Drive out of the car! With your host, Mark Martinez. Remember, just because you're trash doesn't mean you can't do great things. And the English professor. It's called a garbage can, not a garbage cannot. Hey, this is former WWE superstar Duke, the Dumpster Drossy, and you are listening to the Can Crushers Podcast. And welcome back to another Can Crusher Spotlight Chat. I'm super excited. This guy is one of the guys that is why I'm in wrestling. He's an announcer. He's, yep. By, welcome, by the way, Chad. Yes, well, thanks, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is, I reached out to the most, the world's most dangerous announcer, Gary Michael Capetta. And he's like, guys, I'd love to do Can Crushers. So, boom, Please. open the spot. Boom, Gary Michael I'm, Capetta's coming on the show. I'm looking forward to this. I, I'm curious, you know, after reading his book, after obviously he's one of the, one of the most recognizable voices in professional wrestling. He was on a video game, too. Bar right? none, and he was on a video game. Um, I'm interested to see what, what he has to say and about you know various subjects of today and wrestlers from yesteryear and everything. One of the things, of course, after I told you, I told the English professor about this as well, and we're all, we're all on, three of us are on the same page. Is he a fan of... You know, sitting at ringside with Steamboat and Flair. I mean, come on, that, that's a, our most iconic matches, right? That I yeah. need to get that question in there. Yeah, that's that's easily recognized as uh, the greatest three match series in the ever, world. Yeah, ever. Um, you know, you can you can say the Magnum T eight and Nikita Koloff best of seven, but that was kind of a different different Off. flavor. Um, but yeah, the Steamboat Flair matches. I don't know how you couldn't be a fan. Yeah. But having being somebody that was there for all of them, somebody that announced, somebody that's been around those wrestlers, was it going to be, did he think it was going to be something special? Did it live up to expectations? Well, we know or it did. did it flop? Yeah. Well, we know it did. Uh, we're going to get into them. We have a ton of questions in front of us that we're not going to leak any more questions. We, you'll find out when we talk to Mr. Capetta. I'm excited. But what do we have to do first? We have to talk about collar and elbow. Collar and elbow. He's not getting the leads yet. I'm, I'm throwing him up, and he's not catching him yet. Uh, Guys, collar and elbow, you know, we love their hoodies, their tees, their hats, everything they have to offer. It, it's comfortable. It's great wear. Uh, I, I think a new line, because they've been doing it, maybe a spring line is going to be coming up. I'm not saying it is or it's not, so don't throw me under the bus, but they have. Every season, they've kind of thrown something else around, so be on the on the look for some new some new merch coming up. Hey, if it's as good as the last stuff and is comfortable, definitely up for it. Definitely looking forward to it. And you can get 10% off by using our promo code, which is Chad. Can Crushers with capital C's. There you go. You get 10% off your entire order. But, all right, let's send it over to Al and let's get to Mr. Capetta. I'm excited. Wrestling. A love and a passion we all share. I've started a wrestling brand. The wrestling brand. A brand founded on the aspects of wrestling. Two entities working together to create a product that connect emotionally for people everywhere. Collar and Elbow is the brand. Passion and love for wrestling is the drive. I am Al Snow, and this is Collar and Elbow, the wrestling brand. back to Can Crushers Chat. I'm super excited to have our guest come on the show. He's iconic. He's been around for us and it, he is the world's most dangerous announcer. He's got that name from your boy Jim Carnett. 
<laughs> it's Gary Michael Capetta. Mr. Capetta, welcome to Can Crushers. Hey, fellas. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Chad, this guy's also an author. Uh, we just got done reading the book. Well, you did. I read it a while ago. Of Body Slams, Memoirs of Wrestling Pitchman, and Unbelievable Stories. Yeah. I... You, you, you guys must be slow readers. This book has been out a while. <laughs> I've had it forever. It's just I haven't shared it. I'm not going to lie. I just have not shared it with any of these idiots that I call my friends on my podcast. Okay. Well, yeah, I don't want anyone to share my book. Make them go buy it. Uh, see? Yeah, see, he can't uh, make money. Come on. That's how that thing works. But I, Mr. Capetta, have gotten back into my love of wrestling uh, through Mark, who, you know, we're lifelong friends, and now we're traveling, you know, to WrestleCade. We're going to the Crockett Cup, everything like that. So that's my excuse for not being into the books. His, I don't know. I just look at the well, pictures. Well, you have a lot of time. You have a lot of travel time there, you know? A lot I, of time to read that book. Right. But, go ahead. You go, go, you go first. I'll, we'll just kind of dive into questions. Uh, in, in reading the book, there was so many things that I found fascinating. Um, okay. Because of, because of kayfabe back then, learning about this stuff even now, it's like, oh, my God, this stuff really went on. Talk. Talk a little bit, the first thing that I have down, talk to me about what you knew about the uh, Athletic Commission payoffs for the wrestling and that. Um, well, there were, there were payoffs on all different levels. Um, for instance, when I worked, I worked for 11 years with uh, what's now WWE, and for eight of those years I did their TV um, and it was done in the state of Pennsylvania. And by law, um, I should not have been allowed to announce in the state of Pennsylvania. In order to get a, a license, you had to be a resident of Pennsylvania, and I wasn't. Um, same thing with all the Spectrum shows that I did in Philadelphia. Um, so in order for that to happen, they would have to pay off the, um, the commission. Um, for those that go on YouTube and, or the WWE Network and watch those old Spectrum shows, you'll notice that there's always me and another announcer. And the other announcer was the state-appointed announcer. Um, part of their agreement was they didn't want their announcers to lose work. So they brought them in, and I would give them a few matches to announce, and that's how we would proceed. So that's just like a very benign example of, um, of payoffs. I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to with payoffs, but if you want to dig down into something specific that was in the book, let me know. Oh, I was in in general. It just it I find it fascinating that the different federations, different places, to let things not necessarily illegal things, but you know things where they could shut down a show you'd have to people would have to give them a little bit of cash or or you know in some cases i've heard let friends wrestle on the card or give them a job or stuff i just find that with the government and commissions i find it fascinating <laughs> that that's how this ran so you're saying did WWF, you know, AWA, ROH, uh, he's been all over, WCW, right. grease somebody's palms to make something happen. Not asking for specific people. Right. But I'm saying, you know, that kind of just information, things that you knew about that, like what what cost, you know, the most in the payoffs? What was a general thing that was a, a given when you had to do something like that? Right. Well, that's not something that you read in the book. I mean, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, I would have no, I mean, that, that's not the kind of thing that a promoter is going to run around and talk about. Okay. You know? So it's, um, I only know of my situation, and I don't have any idea what kind of money trans okay. was transferred in order to get me to announce. It's just, it's why would they go around and, talk about things that they're doing that's not legal. Right. So I, I, would, I wouldn't know that. All I knew was um, that there was hanky-panky in order to 
allow me to announce where I announced. And I didn't really know. I didn't really care. It was really none of my uh, business. Okay. Fair, fair enough. And I, you know, I just read your part in your book, and I've read in other books where um, wrestlers in that have talked about uh, wrestlers that became bookers, that became owners, talked about the other side of it. But that it's just fascinating all around, no matter what it was, to me. Uh, Mr. Yeah, back, back in the uh, early days, for instance, in the state of New Jersey, everybody had to be licensed. Not only the wrestlers, but the referees, the, the uh, timekeeper, the announcer, all the way down to the person that sold tickets. Um, the state had to license you, and all that meant was that you had to pay a yearly, really minimal um, fee, and, and you were regulated technically by the state, but I never had any interactions with the state. Um, I, I had interactions with the wrestling promoters, um, and they dealt with the state. Okay. Yeah, uh, quick story real quick is I am licensed in Kentucky, so when I go down to OVW, I can do some of the, the camera work, some of the editing, stuff like that. I mean, I'm never getting in the ring, trust me. I, I would get killed by anybody. But I, I even have to have a license in Kentucky to do something, so that's why I have my awesome. Kentucky license. Uh, Mr. Capetta, you just posted something. You're going to get these bouncing back and forth on, on social media, and I loved it because I just watched it probably uh, two weeks ago about... Captain Lou Albano fighting a fan in Pennsylvania. Uh, that was awesome. That, uh, not that it was awesome. It was scary at the same point because he was swinging a chair around. How was that whole atmosphere that night? I mean, it seems crazy. Yeah, there have been um, – that was kind of minor compared to other uh, situations that I would find myself in. Once in Atlantic City, New Jersey, there was uh, – a total riot where uh, knives came out, um, fans at ringside, and there was a stampede toward the doors. You know, all the wrestling fans were trying to get away from these guys that were pulling knives out. So, I mean, there are, bit, there are different levels. Um, there was a night in, um, I think it was Altoona, Pennsylvania, where um, a fan tried to get a Jim Cornette, and this is in the book. Um, <laughs> Big surprise get, there. <laughs> to hop the railing, um, and Jim uh, smacked him in the head with his racket, and the guy bled all over the place. And there, you know, um, there's a, um, a lot of people don't, don't realize that when the, an arena is rocking and the people are screaming and, and you know, let's say they're, they're not happy about what's going on, especially in the, in the days when people believe, that was never... A time of danger. Whenever there's danger coming, there's the, the fans witness something, and as they're digesting it, there's a quiet that goes on in the arena. There's a silence before the eruption, um, and and that's when it you know that's when it gets really serious. Um, within the last couple of months, I got to tell you there was something that. I had to chuckle about, I don't remember where it was, but it was at a WWE show. Sami Zayn was at ringside, and he was managing. And um, I'm going to use a word that's not politically correct, but you can bleep it if you want. Um, and a fan got up and ran to the railing and called him a fag. And Sami Zayn's political correctness clicked in. And he's trying to lecture the guy about how that's not an appropriate word to use. And, and I had to chuckle. It's like Sami Zayn as a manager or any heel manager, your job is to enrage the audience. Your job is to, is to wind the audience up. So you're going to get, if you're successful, a response from that audience, from that audience member's gut. And that's what he got. And Sami Zayn should have been saying to himself, wow, I was successful. What does, what does a 2020 wrestler want from an audience member? Do you want the audience member to run up to the rail and, and all enraged and say and shout, 
you did a bad thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, I mean, you would, uh, th there are different levels of danger. When I announced down at the Bahamas stadiums in the Bahamas, um, it was so dangerous there that to try to prevent um, injury to the performers, the entire ring and the, the walkway leading to the ring was covered in netting. Because there were just these so many things that were hurled at you that, um, first off, they wouldn't be able to keep the ring clean. But, it, you know, it's very dangerous to uh, to be in, you know, in the middle of that. So, you know, there are different levels of danger. That was that was just a fun, a fun clip that I put on my uh, Facebook and Twitter pages. Um, noted, you noticed there were no railings? No. Uh, no. They, I mean, they just they didn't exist at the time. You had the front row and then you had the ring. Um, I probably there were some lawsuits that caused um, promotions to start using some kind of barrier. Yeah, in Pennsylvania, it's it's definitely a law now that you should be using railings. Uh, some of the um, you have a you have a good relationship with Jim Cornette, right? I do. Yes. Yeah. Some of the outlaw mud shows that he likes to call them. Um, <laughs> Uh, still do no railings, but if, if the commissioner would ever come, I mean, that's one of the first things they can get fined on. And, uh, you know, we, we've we been to some. Uh, you know, we've yeah. been to some that still don't do it, but the commissioner can't make it to every spot, so they're they're kind of hoping and praying that he doesn't pop up someday. But, yeah, uh, that was my main point there with the railings. I, want, I really wanted to talk about that. The commissioner should make it at every point if you're – if you're licensed and the commissioner's getting paid to do what he's doing, why isn't he showing up? He Cor should be showing up. Correct. Something uh, from your book, Mr. Capetta, that I, I took was uh, that you spoke about the Grand Wizard and Gordon Soley um, to a, uh, an admirable degree, uh, what you felt about them and thought about them. Talk a little bit about their, their influence on your career. That's interesting that no one has ever brought those two names up to me um, in one question. And, you know, as you're asking the question, um, here's how they bookend my career. Um, when I began, I was not allowed in the wrestler's locker room. I was an outsider. I was given the information as to who to announce. But I was never um, allowed inside. I had to dress elsewhere. Um, and the Grand Wizard was the first insider to bring me in, to have the faith in me to begin to speak frankly about the business. Um, and um, I, I would go down and visit him. He had a, a home in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, so he... He was like a consultant at the beginning of my career. Towards the end of my WCW days, when I was having um, differences with management, Gordon Soley would um, talk me through, talk me down from you know my anger about what was going on with the management at WCW. So both of those gentlemen, the Grand Wizard of Wrestling, Ernie Roth, and Gordon Soley, um, they, you know, they, they were great friends during both my um, introduction to wrestling and at my height of exposure in WCW. Um, and, and yeah, and that, that's that's what will tie them together. That's awesome. It's it's funny to hear, you, you know, from somebody how okay this guy started somebody that you may not expect was your first if you want to say it, friend in the business that kind of let you in to somebody that is, you know, not really arguably, but is considered the best announcer ever in pro wrestling. Yeah, I um, yes. It's it's the stories, I'm, I'm sure, of things that they've done, uh, you could go on. 
But I got a, a, a question I'm going to tag along with that. You made a comment about um, differences in manage, differences with management and WCW. Would that have anything to do with uh, Chapter 18, Capetta can't be trusted? I Honestly, you have to get a little more specific. In, in your book, the, uh, Chapter 18, The Final Bell, Capetta can't be trusted, and it has stories about Eric Bischoff. It seemed like, I don't, I don't want to say kind of snowballing you or keeping you under a watch maybe. Oh, um, you know, that, that was kind of outrageous to me. I, I think I under, I think I remember what that reference, that reference is. Um, probably my final announce duties, assignments with WCW. Um, there were different things that happened and management just expected the worst of me. For instance, uh, the last time that I knew I was doing a WCW Saturday Night TV show from center stage, um, I, I wanted to uh, thank the audience. Uh, because before we would go on the air, most of my work, most of my, especially my uh, creative work, happened when the cameras were not rolling and when I was interacting with the, with the crowd. So what we wanted was um, a raging crowd when we went on the air. So I would have to get the, the fans up and screaming and multiple times in the course of a night. And at the center stage, there was a core of fans that were always there. So we got to know each other from a distance, but I worked more or less in front of the same crowd. And when I, when I was younger, and it was a territory time, and there were wrestlers coming in and out and, and challenging Bruno San Martino, all of a sudden they would appear and they would have their run with San Martino and then after he beat them and they made their run around the big arenas, they would disappear and no one would ever say anything about them. And I would wonder, like, what happened to you? So I, I didn't want that to be the case with me. Um, and, of course, it was a different era. It was 20 years later. So um, as I began to thank the folks, um, there must the word must have gotten back to management, and one by one they came out to watch me, to, to see what, just to watch me announce, just to kind of like stare me down. I guess I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I got the sense that they thought that I was going to badmouth the promotion on the way out because it was my last time there, and and I, I just said to myself, like you really don't know me, do you? Like you think I have absolutely no professionalism. Um, the same thing happened in the last pay-per-view that I did in St. Petersburg, Florida, where the flight that they booked me on was late, so I was late in getting to the production meeting. And, you know, they couldn't think, well, we hope Gary's okay, we hope, you know, we don't know why he's late, because I had never missed a show in, you know, now it's my 40-year involvement in the business. I've never missed a show. By the time I got to the production meeting, they had assigned my job to someone else. It was like, what? well, it's his best show, so he, he's just not going to shine. He's just going to screw us. And it was like, are you kidding me? Like, do you not know me? Like, how many years do we have to work with each other? How many years do you have to have known me? How is it even possible that I could last in this business for so many decades if I was such a diabolical individual, it's, it, it just amazed me that they just expected that I would be some run-of-the-mill scum. So, so the back... A, a sarcastic title for that chapter. So the backstage politics, so to speak, in WCW actually were front and center with you as well then? Um, yeah. Yeah, to a point, that. to a point, yeah. Do you do you think that, like, your personal, your issues like you've just described, do you think that was because of the lack of knowledge of the wrestling that the people in charge had at the time? No, I don't 
think it's a knowledge thing. I, I just think that just very poor instincts and very um, poor or lack of leadership qualities. I'm going to bounce back to well, one of our favorite feuds. Uh, you were actually part of center stage again. Uh, you announced Flair and Steamboat matches all over the place. Um, did you know it was going to be something special, like one of the first times? Did you become a fan, actually, and get engulfed in, the, in those matches? Or did you still do your job, you know, with air quotes? You know, did you just enjoy the moment? I absolutely uh, knew that it was something special. Um, when, when people ask me um, the most memorable matches that I announced, I always break it into um, – segments and in that decade the Ricky Steamboat Ric Flair matches um, Chicago Nashville and New Orleans were uh, yeah they, they were something special and um, they, it was it was just an incredible um, series of matches and, and, and run yeah I was uh, I, I was really pleased to be uh, a small part of that. On the same aspect of being a fan now, you'll see I'm the one that jumps back and forth. How much wrestling do you get to watch now? And I'm always the one, I'll stir the pot. What is your favorite right now? Is it NWA, to, you know, the throwback? Do you love the New Age AEW? Or are you uh, in the same bucket with WWE? Um, I, I get to watch as much as, as you know, time allows, as much as I can. Um and uh, there's a lot of uh, good stuff out there. And, um, um, I, yeah, I, I try to keep up with WWE and AEW, and I watch NWA every week. Um, you know, there's there's such uh, – they're, they're different products, especially NWA compared to the others. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was keeping up with Ring of Honor for, um, for a while. Um, and then there's MLW out there. Right. So, yeah, I, I do keep up with it. And there's, you know, a, a favorite. There's, you know, there's no, like, favorite, favorite. You, you would enjoy each one for different reasons. There are, um, there are different goals. There are different intents. I mean, all of it is to entertain, but they all go about it in a different way. So sometimes it's not even fair to, to, comparing, to compare them. Well said. We kind of say that every week on, on the show. Well, that's exactly what our you know sentiments are. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Go ahead, Chad. No. <laughs> well, though, this is uh, something I want to pull on your experience with being in the business and uh, seeing so many things. There's, over the, la over the years, there's been events within wrestling that have done, you know, I want to say harm to the business um, or just, you know, have really dampened the business. Um, some things I kind of think of are the the death of the Von Erichs, um, Owen Hart's, the Chris Benoit incident, uh, Magnum TA's accident, Bruiser Brody's murder. These kind of things or any specific um, thoughts on these exact instances and how you saw it affect wrestling? Um, boy, I didn't think you were going there. I thought you were going in a different direction. <laughs> I thought you were going to be talking about, um, when you say dampening the business, I thought you were going to be talking about um, wrestling. That doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it's, it's life. It's life and death. It's... Um, there are there is evil in the world, and so, and it, and it, it's you know in wrestling as it is in every walk of life, and there are accidents that happen, and that can't be prevented. So um, you know I, I never looked at all of what you just said in one um, you know with one thought, um, and just like in life you you know you bounce back every. Sport, every entertainment form, every walk of life has uh, black eyes, and so you just, um, you know, you just have to, you have to move on. 
you know, some some you have more um, empathy for because they affect people's real lives. Um, but it's uh, you know it's it's no different than um, you know than life in general. All right, well, let's stir the pot and go the way that you were thinking. Then, how about the one that infuriates us is probably Joey Ryan in his shtick. Uh, that's what I think is dampening wrestling on my end. Do you have any thoughts on anything like that that dampens your wrestling? I would say that. Um... Um, anything that is illogical um, about one competitor or if it's a tag match, two against two, um, anything that's illogical that happens in the ring um, does not lend to adding any kind of credibility to the moment. So I'll uh, give you an example when a wrestler... Um, mounts the top turnbuckle, faces inside the ring, and does a backward flip onto the floor. How stupid is that? Like, like, would anyone ever do that if they had the intention of beating their opponent? Like, how stupid is that? So anything like that, I mean, um, there, are, there are little bits of... of um, there are little bits that can be done, you know, that are entertaining in, in, in a match, but, but you know that that kind of thing that's that's just or or a group of um, wrestlers standing in place for thirty seconds to forty seconds waiting to to catch a wrestler who's flying over the top rope. I mean, if your goal is to try to lend some kind of credibility to the fact that it's person versus person or team versus team, and the object is to pin or make your opponent submit, that wouldn't, there, there's no place for that. It just, just doesn't make any sense. So did so, you, uh, go ahead, I'm and, sorry. And it, Maybe not every promotion's goal is to bring realism. They, well, if that's the case, then I, then I guess that you can have your show Maybe you shouldn't call it pro wrestling, right? Call it something else. I agree. Did you see the clip recently, uh, or within the last week, week and a half, of the Hawk boy jumping off of the second story at a mall? Did, did you see that, and did you just go, man, they're killing the sport? Um, I... Was, was this the fellow that was on um, NWA Power? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, I did. I did see it somehow. I'm not even sure where. Um, no, not. I, I wouldn't put that in in the same category. I, I I think that I wouldn't advise this kid to do what he did. But um, I'm not sure. Because I have no idea how why he was up there. Like, was there a fight up there? Did he just run up there to jump off? I have no idea. Like how that came to be. But um, yeah. So anything that's that's illogical, really, uh, just sort of rubs me the wrong way. Something, Mr. Capetta, that seems to be a hot topic across everywhere in wrestling is male versus female matches. Um, going to the extreme of, like, impact with Tessa Blanchard against guys like Brian Cage and... How, how do you how do you look at that when you like you're talking something that doesn't make a lot of a lot of sense does no good for wrestling a hundred and twenty pound woman versus a three hundred pound plus guy that you know looks like he'll kill you with by just looking at you yeah well I think it, I don't think that that is um illogical if he wins in 15 seconds but i mean like her her pulling off her win. winning and her being uh, a, a world I, champion i just address that i mean if if it, i don't have yeah. a problem with a guy against a girl i mean they do that in high school now yeah right in, in scholastic wrestling but should um should the match last more than 15 seconds 
you know, it's, it's, it's what they do with that that to be the problem. Okay. Uh, one of the things we're big, I'm a big gamer as well, and I'd like to go back um, to talk about, uh, you were part of the Showdown Legends of Wrestling game. You, you did most of the voiceovers. Um, how fun was that? I mean, that's something that me, I, I would love to do. Uh, just Can you talk about that, just putting that together a little bit? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing that. Um, the one problem that they didn't uh, foresee is that my announce style is a, is a big, booming style. And those games are put together um, where I'm announcing, for instance, weight after weight after weight, city after city after city. So uh, Chicago, Illinois, Cincinnati, Ohio, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And, and someone who booms like I do, your voice, your can't withstand 10 hours of that you know I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to get hoarse and I'm going to lose my voice and that is what happened one day um, but I, I really in, you know enjoyed doing it I was happy to be uh, to be part of that yeah uh, caught your voice right off the bat when I got that game and I'm like oh my god oh my god uh, again jumping around AWA uh, I wish was still around. I think if they would have had a better marketing team, they would have had a longer presence. Is that kind of your same thought? Because look at who's come from AWA, some of our greatest stars. Um, yeah, you know, the um, once Vern stepped out of the territory, once or once McMahon stepped into his territory, and he had to compete, uh, I think that was just nothing that Byrne was accustomed to. He, you know, he wasn't used to competing with anyone while the AWA product, when it was a territory and had no competition, was, you know, it was, it was really, really good wrestling. He never had to count a program. And, um, and so that's a, that's a whole different skill. That's a whole different approach <clears throat> when you are mapping out your promotion. And, and I, I think that was the um, that you know that was a major major uh, problem that he had. It was, he was just doing something that he he, he wasn't um, accustomed to doing. It, it wasn't it wasn't what he excelled at. Okay. Jumping back on your book real quick, I see when we were doing some research, and I'm sorry I I didn't get to see it yet, and I, I want to know where I can. You've actually made. And directed, starred in Body Slams and Beyond about the book, your one man show. Um, is that is that anywhere that we can watch it on, like Amazon or anything like that? No, not currently. Um, um, I had created that that show back in two thousand two, um, and then I put it on the shelf for a while. A few years ago, I brought it back out and I toured. Um, most of the country, you know, for uh, one one night stands, um, and had a really good time doing it. Drew a lot of very um, educated fans because you know it's a it's a two hour show, in, including a fifteen minute intermission, and then toward the end, uh, I take questions from the audience. Um, and I, I, it was just a lot of fun to do, and um, I'm still. Um, I'm supposed to, um, there's a promoter in upstate New York who wants me to bring the show up that way, and I'm still open to invitations to, uh, to bring the show out. I mean, I've never had the show, for instance, on the West Coast, and I think that would be a fun thing to do. Something that I wanted to uh, ask you about, somebody specific, um, was really huge in this area, Pennsylvania, being so close to Pittsburgh and that. What good or bad, what are some favorite stories about Bruno Sammartino? Um, well, Bruno Sammartino is the reason that I became a wrestling fan. And um, the first night that I stepped into the ring to announce, he was in the main event against Nikolai Volkov defending his title. Um, and I was just in awe of him. 
as the years went on, I got to know him. And um, so I, I feel blessed for that to begin with. And he sort of defied the, uh, the, the um, what people just accept that anyone that's your hero could never live up to that billing once you got to know them. He was an individual that superseded, um, you know, how I, how I looked at him before once I got to, to know him, you know, the personal side of Bruno. He was very, um, uh, for, I'll give you an example. Back in the early 90s, um, 900 uh, telephone services were, were all the rage, and there was a Bruno Lou hotline. And uh, I contracted to go into New York and do the voice for that. Um, it's, it's like a, it, it was very much like doing the video game, actually. Um, and, and then I was brought back to do a boxing game. And there was a, a, a boxer by the name of Nino Benvenuti. And I had no problem announcing his name or pronouncing his name, but I had a problem announcing his uh, hometown. So I had no idea, and the technicians that were in New York had no idea. So I said, well, let's call Bruno and get him. He, I mean, he'll tell us how to pronounce that. And um, when he picked up the phone and I said hello to him, he didn't want to talk about that. He didn't want to talk about wrestling. He wanted to talk about me personally. He wanted to catch up with what was going on with me. He, uh, when he heard I was working full-time with WCW at the time, he said, really? He said, so you're not teaching school now? Because I was a, a school teacher by trade. I said, no. He said, well, you be sure that, you know, you watch yourself. You be sure they don't take advantage of you. And then he went on and asked about my family and my family's business. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, this is Bruno San Martino. This is like an international mm -hmm. superstar. And I'm a ring announcer. And he remembers details about my life. It, he was just an incredible person who, um, who really deserved all the accolades that he received. I hope you got a royalty check from those 900 numbers because I had a probably $900 bill on my mom's phone because I would call, listen a little bit, hang up, call back, listen a little bit. At one point, I didn't get an allowance or all my paper route money it went to uh, the phone bill because I was addicted to that thing. It was unbelievable. You probably still should be paying for that. You're right. <laughs> I really, thank you. Thank you. On, on a uh, little su different subject than uh, Bruno, much different subject, in your book, you talked about the blacklisting of wrestlers what what can you kind of tell us about that? Um, I mean, feel free to throw any names out there, but more so, what were what were uh, some of the things that got wrestlers blacklisted, so to speak? Um, I would put it under like one general category would be not to cooperate with the promoter. Um, um, Bruno San Martino talks about that openly in his original autobiography about how he was blacklisted by uh, Vince McMahon Sr. This was prior to his becoming champion. Um, he, he was, um, you know, there, there were certain things that he wouldn't do. He was, he was just a very ethical kind of guy. So what McMahon did was um, booked him in Baltimore, didn't tell him he was booked in Baltimore, when he didn't show, McMahon filed a complaint with the Maryland State Athletic Commission, and the commissions were all connected. So um, one commissioner calls the next commissioner, calls the next commissioner, and Bruno, after before you know it, wasn't allowed to wrestle, for instance, in San Francisco. He was wondering why his bookings dried up. And in order for him to make a comeback, he had to go to Canada and uh, start from scratch. He started over again and, and built his career up again until he became so popular that McMahon had to relent and the rest is history. In you know, May of 1963, San Martino became his champion. 
and and was a mainstay for uh, you know for more than a decade. So um, you know so that's that's really not um, secondhand knowledge. It's you know Bruno you know would sit down and you know and talk about it. Is there any is there any wrestlers that you can think of or that that got? I know you're saying not cooperating with the promoters, but is there any that got blacklisted for just, I want to say, abhorrent behavior, injuring people, um, stuff like, things like that, that they just weren't good to use because they were dangerous? Um, I, I, I would just say, I, I wouldn't use the word blacklisted for that. I would just say that if, um, you know, performers not up to the level that, um, that roster, you just don't hire him. I don't consider that to be um, blacklisting. Blacklisting is 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 where um, all of the promoters across the country and all the territories band together to um, to dry up the work of, of a, you know, to drive someone out of the out of the industry. Well, Mr. Capetta, I, I know uh, you have you have a lot going on, so we always like to kind of end with uh, you giving a shout out to all your social media. I know you're on Patreon now; you have a lot going on. So, tell us, you know, what's going on with you, and then uh, give us all your social medias so um, our fans can start following you, and you can get an influx. Uh, you have a ton of people on there already, but of course, uh, anything that you do, uh, your Patreon's really awesome. The, um, we've got a, a the Facebook page is really the, the center of it all, um, where there's a fan subscription, and um, folks can uh, pay a buck fifty a week, and uh, and get some uh, of the inside views that I don't share on the free pages. So that's Facebook at my initials, G M C, the number four real, G M C for real on Facebook, and then it's Gary Capetta on Twitter, and, um, you know, that's, that, that, those would be the main places to go. And do you have, uh, are you going out and about? I know you said you'd like to, to bring it back. Do you have anything scheduled, maybe besides that New York one coming up, that we can bounce around and see you? I'm taking some time off um, in the, um, in the process of, transitioning from um, one state to another state so I'm just sort of I mean if I if I get a call and someone's interested but I'm not I'm not pushing it and uh, so no I, I don't have anything in person that uh, that I want to promote right now okay well if there was I'll, I'll just say this in in parting if there was ever somebody in in wrestling out, outside of the wrestlers themselves that I would want to meet and, you know, especially meet, maybe witness, do their work, sir, it would definitely be you. Um, yeah, oh, but you're, that's why I reached out to him, Chad. Come on. Absolutely. Uh, you're, you're absolutely one of the kind, one of a kind. Um, you broke the mold, and, you know, I would, I would love to see you at something like the – Crockett Cup or WrestleCade or something like that. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Well, maybe someday we'll get together, crush some cans, and and catch up. Yeah, would I, love to. Yeah. <laughs> again, thank you once again for for the time today. I appreciate it, fellas. You take care. First off, Chad, what an amazing human being. You take wrestling out of the book. What he was a gentleman. Nothing but a gentleman. He answered everything. Uh, man, this was awesome. This was, I, I'm shaking. Yeah, this was uh, really good. I, I got the goosebumps. You know, him talking, uh, when we talk about Bruno San Martino, yeah. who was huge to Pennsylvania, huge to our area, um, talking about Bruno and how, you know, you'll get some guys that'll be nice to the, you know, fans when they have to be and everything like that. But he said that Bruno was genuinely a really nice guy and he had morals that you know as listen to the podcast I don't want to give it away a huge story with Bruno and McMahon senior 
Yeah. That absolutely great question on the blacklist mind. thing. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, that you was, dug, yeah. you dug deeper. I, I've been following Mr. Capetta's social media pages, and that's where you know I actually I saw uh, the. Albano swinging, you know, fighting the fan that was swinging a chair around a couple weeks ago, and it was just a couple days ago. He posted it on his, and man, if you don't subscribe to his Patreon to get that extra little bit of news, I, I think I think you need to. Yeah, it's it's a dollar fifty a week. It it's a cup you, of coffee. Yeah, anymore. It really is a cup yeah, of coffee. It's, it's a donut. It's a donut a week for big guys like me. I don't um, know if I can give up the donut. I can, I can give, give up, up a donut a I week. I can't give up the cup of coffee. <laughs> but he, his, um, just his knowledge, and you kind of want to, and he, he'll he'll say it at the beginning, he set the tone for the interview. Not in a directive no. way or anything like that, but he's like, guys, he said, I'll tell you what, you can ask this, this, and this, and I'll give you short answers because I've answered it a million times. A million times. Or you can hit me out of left field with stuff. I think and, we did. And we did. And, I mean, there's a couple of spots where he'll be like, wow, I didn't think you were going there, but good question. Or, hey, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, never had these two names right. that I brought up, that. you know, brought up in the same, in the same question. Yeah. This, this was amazing. This was fun. I enjoyed it 100%. Chad, thanks for coming down today on oh. short notice. Oh, no, no problem at all, no problem at all. And, hey, best part is, we got an open invitation to crush some cans with him. Yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> Just we get had, a hold of him. We had a couple beers. He had he had a drink, he said. No, uh, he, he, he was having some apple juice. He was having some apple juice. So, not like us, we're having beers. Yep, we're already. Having, already. It's early in the morning and we're drinking beer, but that's the way it is here on Can Crushers. Guys, uh, again, this was a great interview. If you know anybody that you know you want us to reach out to, you know, we're we're continuing to reach out to everybody. But if there's one person that you're like, hey, I'd like that, you know, send us an email at cancrusher69 at gmail.com. All social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are at cancrusher69. You know, hit us up there. We'll be able to reach out to people, show them what we do, and, and everything. It's just these spotlight shows are just they're getting better yeah this is it's it's reliving the past from from different perspectives yeah you know you're talking you're talking one of the an, premier announcers the announcer um you know from him to won't give away some that we have lined up but one of the most uh influential wrestlers in southern history coming up yep um, that, that's in the it. works. It's in the works. In the he, wor- he's got to call me back. His his ducks have to be in a line. Is exactly it's, what he said. And it's just getting into this. Just kind of gives it more of the field and just talking about. We have our hey. spot where we talk about everyday, everyday wrestling stuff and weekly stuff and pay per view stuff. This kind of is like a uh, a throwback. Yeah, that's what I, that's what it, I planned it for. It, exactly. It just. Bringing up, you know, to the I want to say to the older, older crowd names and and you're giddy like every that. week. You're giddy every week. Oh, I'm like a I'm like a fat kid in a candy store on this one. Well, you're giving up your donut because you're going to subscribe to his Patreon. Yep, no problem. Hey guys, again, thanks for a great week. And just remember, just because you're trash doesn't mean you can't do great things. It's called a garbage can. A garbage can. Not a garbage cannot. Sorry, I'm missing everything, people. Uh, We'll get it straight maybe by next week.